news media in 2050. What if tomorrow never comes? It's quite gloomy, and here's a spoiler alert for later. We don't know exactly what's going to happen in the next 30 years, but we do know what happened in the last 30 years, especially in journalism. And uh, just a reminder, some of you will know that the cell phones we had in 1992 were about this big. We had a 2G standard. If you went out there with a camera crew, you were four or five people. And maybe you even remember what the most successful album of 1992 was. It was Whitney Houston with Bodyguard. So you can see a lot of things can happen in 30 years, and that's what we're here to discuss today. Uh, it's not only important about what will we have in 2050, but how do we survive the journey? Here's a little video for you. Hi, I'm Chaitanya Marpakwar from the Times of India in Mumbai. And my question was about uh, data and statistics. As we know, the pandemic was also, also an infodemic of sorts. A lot of data is still floating around. Uh, but I wanted to know if the audiences are bored of this overload of data and statistics and how this kind of data can be presented in a more attractive and interactive way. And to discuss this with us today is the editor-in-chief of NTV and RTL News Business and Science from Germany, Sonja Schwetje. Give her a hand. We have the editor-in-chief of the Thomson Reuters Foundation with us today. Please welcome Yassir Khan. Also with us, a blogger from Nigeria, remotely at least. You should be able to see him on the screen pretty soon. And uh, we had a discussion whether he was one of the most influential bloggers of Africa. He said he wouldn't say that of himself. I know a lot of people who would say that of himself. He's also the founder of Alpha Reach and on the board of the Halifax International Security Forum. Please welcome from Nigeria, JJ Omar Juba. Oh. <laughs> what are you doing here? Everybody told me you were alive. <laughs> it's the future. And of course, we have the head of news partnerships Central Europe from Meta, formerly known as Facebook, Guido Bülow, is here as well. Please welcome Guido. And now, actually, for you, we have the right video, the one we wanted to show you earlier. What did it used to be like? What will it become? This is the big question that media professionals and companies are asking themselves. Welcome to our vision for the future. News media in 2050. If tomorrow never comes. Insight and foresight into future news reporting. Shaping tomorrow, now. All right, uh, first question to you, Sonia. Um, our, uh, excuse my French here, but good old-fashioned journalists like you and myself, dying species. No. Um, I think the more technology changes the way we do our job, the more important the human factor, the journalistic factor will become. And it is. I mean, we've changed. We are not TV only. We are not broadcasters only. We are cross-media uh, news organizations. and. I'm sure that if we use technology in the right way, it can help us reach our audiences in a better way and also verify things, um, get uh, a grip on all the data that tech is giving. I don't know. I'm. Yeah. Ah, okay. Go ahead. Um, and, and find better ways to give orientation, to sort out things in that huge maze of data. So, no, I think we'll have a future. <laughs> And uh, if you look at platforms like Facebook to open up the conversation here, Guido, do you think it's helping your journalism to be on Facebook? I think Facebook and all big platforms make a way to reach audiences and shows us how and where do we have to be with our content in order to reach audiences, younger audiences, for example, or audiences interested in politics, in business news, but we can learn from that. Um, and we have to make use because what we do is of value and a lot of people realize that. Um, and within all the flood of information, of also disinformation, um, the journalistic content, the brands they trust, um, the content that is presented by news organizations who are 
regulated to uh, work according to codes and um, who are also um, to be made accountable for what they do, uh, they are appreciated by some audiences. It's not an easy task and we have to work for it well, every on, day. Let me put that question to Guido right there. Yes. Do you see that traditional brands that have established their brand over the decades are appreciated on your platform? I think so, yes. Of course we see that. Um, we have a lot of established partnerships with well-known media, with RTL, for example, with Reuters, Thomson, sorry, uh, and many others uh, for various different products that we have on the platform, where we, for example, with the launch of Facebook News in some markets across the world, for example, UK or Germany, where we highlight credible, um, reliable information um, from yeah, well-known publishers, broadcasters in the industry. So, um, yes, we do see that, that um, those publishers are really successful on our platform. But, of course, what we also see is, like, the rise of newsfluencers, for example. I mean, just last week, we saw the Reuters news report coming out and highlighting this is one of the facts that um, it's not just broadcasters and publishers anymore, but there are many other players that are emerging and rising, and um, which is probably heating up the competition uh, when it comes to journalism. JJ, because you made a miraculous appearance here, I believe you can also see the future. And uh... <laughs> I mean, first of all, it's to say that um, I'll start by telling a short story that I think everybody can relate to. So nine years ago, I came down from Savini Platz in Berlin. Mm. I was teaching at Fry University, and I saw this person begging for arms, and they had a big dog beside them, the sort of dog that in Nigeria, you had to be rich to have it. You had to leash it. You had to be a rich yeah. person. You okay, had to I'll have a lot of money to have a dog like that beside you. It was, it was a big dog. It was okay. like a German Shepherd, well-fed, yeah. Right. So I, I saw this person begging for arms with this big dog from where I, where I come from. You had to be rich to have that sort of stuff. So I asked my friend, like, what's going on here? This person is begging for money, and they have a big dog beside them. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. So she said, oh, that actually in Germany, when you're in that situation, that normally you have a right to a dependent. And in this person's case, it's most likely that the dog is their dependent. That really smashed my head. Like, it was a big smash on my head. And it was a long walk home, but I kept thinking about how all of us exist in different worlds. And we are constantly judging the world based on the things that we know. It doesn't matter whether you're a journalist or a psychologist or a politician, whatever. Our behaviors, our actions are always moderated by the limitations of our perspectives. Talking about the future, you can hold that because that's going to influence some of the other things I say. Talking about the future, None of us knows the future. I think that's one of the most absolute things about the future. But we can have an understanding of the future if we take a look at the past, first of all, and also look at the present. And if you take a look at the past, we begin to see how if we do not make certain changes to happen now in the present, then the future we get will reflect the past we're coming from. So in Nigeria, and I think most of Africa, there's something we call Mongo Parking. It's from the word Mongo Park. So, I think 1796, Mongo Park supposedly discovered River Niger, right? And if you put it on Google right now, who discovered River Niger, it comes out as Mongo Park. Where are we going with this for the future of journalism? It comes out, it comes out as Mongo Park. So I'm going to land on the future of journalism. And this thing has been over 200 years old, and it still gets recorded as Mongo Park. But that's not the true story, because before Mongo Park discovered River Niger, people lived there. They called it a name. But because for over 200 years, it's been told that Mongo Park discovered River Niger, then it stays as that. The same thing with the, the Amazon. The person that discovered the Amazon, according to the written records on Google and everywhere else, named the forest after the women he fought there. So they existed there, they lived there, but he claims and story claims that he discovered it. So with the future of journalism, one thing we must pay attention to is that the world has changed and you cannot report your news according to where you're coming from alone. Mm. You must report it according to the reality of the world. So much so that that world does not reflect around primarily 
the interests and the feelings and the problems of the West, but the interests and the feelings and the problems of the world. So that's the future of journalism that I think everybody must, everybody must pursue. So not a future that we're just waiting to happen. It's a future that we must constructively also make happen. And yes, sir, you deal with these topics a lot. The, the research you do reflects a lot of this. Do, do you agree with this? Look, uh, a long time ago, I was recruited for a job, and I was interviewed for a job, and one of the news bosses asked me, um, so what's the next big, thing, next big thing in journalism? What's it gonna be? And I took a second and I said, it's journalism. <laughs> it was always the big thing, and it should always be the big thing. So what I think journalists should avoid is to be distracted by the tools that are becoming available to us as a result of technology, the platforms, the phones, the cameras, the ready access to all sorts of information. And instead, you know, stay true to the maxim of being fair and accurate. And, and, um, and I know, I realize that in some places, it's difficult to do that. I just heard, uh, listened to a journalist from Myanmar on, in this very seat earlier today. And they're sharing Google Docs with, with, their, with their audiences. But the key is they're trusted and they're valued because they have a record of being fair and accurate. And I think 30 years from now, if journalists stay true to that, no matter what tool they use, what platform they use, um, you know, they will have the public's trust and, 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 and a following. Um, and I think if there's one thing I would like our audience to take away, our audience of journalists to take away, is to stay true to the Fairness and accuracy, Maxim. But if you, say, if you say that the technology doesn't play a major role, it's about journalism, what do you think about the plans, for example, of the metaverse? I mean, at least it's a plan. Um, it is a plan. And again, if you are going to be a journalist on the metaverse, if you're not fair and accurate, <laughs> okay. you're toast. I see uh, where you're the, going. <laughs> the second thing I will say is, and journalists don't do this, I grew up in an era and I still am in an era where a bunch of middle class people get into a room in the morning and they decide what's important to tell the world. I mean, what utter, pardon my French, horseshit, right? Uh, this is the first time in our existence that we've had the capability of listening to the people who are consuming what we say and yet we act as if those people don't exist. Um, and even if they do, we look at them in terms of numbers. We published an article, how many people came to it? We never really thought about whether or not they even want it a few years ago, one employer I used to work for did a survey, it was a public broadcaster, uh, we did a survey about what we were reporting and what our audiences were looking for. And there were two ships crossing in the night. Um, you know, we were covering politics and war and intrigue. They wanted health care, uh, municipal uh, issues. They wanted to know how their lives were being impacted or how the lives of other people in other parts of the world who were very, very similar to them were being impacted. They couldn't care less about the bang bang, right? So, you know, besides the fairness and accuracy, uh, um, you know, incentivize um, listening to your audiences. Last thing is quit playing, uh, quit doing journalism of outrage. You know, one, one thing, I, I, I love you, man, but one thing I will say about platforms like yours is there's incentivization of outrage. Um, and that leads you into a downward spiral uh, of, of, you know, outrage versus outrage versus outrage, because the interest is to keep the people on the platform, right? You know, as long, you know, as, long as people are on the platform, you know, this is, that's the whole purpose um, uh, of the algorithm. And outrage really does that very well. But imagine if journalists en masse uh, stopped doing outrage journalism. Um, again, which leads me back to the fairness and accuracy. I think, you know, folks would be concerned about creating algorithms that incentivize outrage. I, Sonia has uh, her hand up, so we'll go to Sonia first, and then obviously, Guido, you have the chance to react to that. Yeah, because I completely agree that it's the core of journalism to be with uh, reporters on the ground and fact check things and um, make verification of videos and photos and that is the most important thing to ensure the future. But there have to be some things that must be secured and I know it's not very uh, sexy to talk about regulation but I think it is important that we make sure um, that journalistic content can be found, that algorithms are not gatekeeping 
in the way that um, the disinformation reaches more people and has Agreed. a greater impact than the correction. So that is a big thing. And the second thing that has to be made sure is that there must be ways of refinancing. We have a pluralistic media landscape in Germany, so um, it needs more revenue streams. For example, um, license fees, for example, advertising, subscriptions, donations. But we need to create an ecosystem where all that is possible. And this is, uh, I think, needed to ensure that journalistic work will still be aware, well, people will still be aware of it. I absolutely agree with you. In fact, in my hand, I have a list of not what the future of journalism looks like, but what I think it should look like. Can uh, we first yeah, give Guido a chance yeah, to react to that? Yeah, okay. of course, of course. Thank you. Um, I mean, let me be really clear. We don't have any interest on content that is polarizing, that is like misleading or whatsoever. This is why we invested a lot of money in the last few years to fight misinformation on our platform. I mean, we have by far the largest fact-checking operations um, globally from all platforms. Um, by the way, right now in Oslo, we have the International Fact-Checking uh, Summit and where we're coming together with hundreds of fact-checking organizations, 80, by the way, for, are working for us, um, helping us to keep the platform safe and clean and removing misinformation or downranking misinformation. So a lot has happened uh, over the past few years and we don't really benefit from um, like polarizing content, misleading content on our platform. It's quite the opposite. And I think like our executives have been outspoken about that in the past few years plenty of times. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, quite the opposite. I mean, we're trying to invest into like sustainable journalism with partnerships like yours, um, ours, for example, um, with the um, journalism course that we um, set up last year um, through the Meta Journalism Program, mm -hmm. uh, through products that we built together just to highlight the good content that we have on the platform because it exists. I mean, there's one thing though that um, when you, again, look at the Reuters news report, I think there is a, there is a chance um, to look into, and I'm also referring to what we have seen in the beginning about the data piece. When you use data and look at what people are actually consuming, we see a shift in media consumption. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I personally feel like this is not something we have taken into consideration, really. Um, and I used to be a journalist as well, so I'm, I'm saying we. Um, so what people nowadays are consuming is like more and more video rather than reading texts, which have been around for ages. Um, and especially when you look at the younger people, the young ad adults that we are all are looking for uh, when it comes to advertising revenue, subscriptions, or just simply by attracting them to your brand and let them stick to your brand, um, that they're really into these new apps like Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, and, and short form video and digest information in a totally different way. But it, to me, it feels like we haven't really accounted for that and are still sticking to like old formats. You're, you're, on that, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the biggest problems in our industry is that old people are making content for young people, right? Uh, and, and, and that content ends up being a caricature of what they think their kids are doing. But yes, according to our news report, what has happened is you know young people you know 18 to 25 year olds are accessing are a exhausted of the barrage of news that comes to them from mainstream media b are um, are are basically going to off plat uh, other platforms predominantly social platforms to consume the news and and so but legacy news organizations have not caught up with that right uh, they are sticking to audiences that they know rather than the audiences that will grow old with them. Um, and so that has been one of the biggest fallacies of, of uh, mainstream media. Do you, do you recommend old people to no, don't be journalists anymore? No, I, I recommend old people to hire young people to make content for young people. Understood. JJ, I want to bring you back in the conversation. You're a successful blogger, so you obviously know how to play the algorithms. How much is that a consideration? Or would you say, I'm just lucky because what I post is interesting. I think it's been more intuitive, and I think that technology is a net positive. Um, for a lot of young people across the continent, the way we've used technology, when I say the continent, in this case, I mean Africa, that for a long time we just read things about ourselves on platforms and we couldn't correct people. There was one of these platforms reporting monkeypox in Europe 
and using a picture of someone from, from Africa. And another African platform, I think Citizens Kenya platform, did a counter report. Man, the and, number of times I've mm, killed stories like that yeah. after becoming editor in chief. So the democratization of voices is a big deal that technology offers. And as more people continue to assess, you know, people that are not able to assess it at the moment, as the prices go down, more people will come on board. And there will be a sense of justice in the way that people from places that are ordinarily forgotten, except when they're reporting conflict or poverty or corruption, can begin to get on these big platforms, not on account of these issues, but on account of just being humans, like just mainstreaming conversations around them being human. Because on the biggest platforms today, I don't want to call their names, they have special programs for when great things are happening in these countries. So for Africa, you say Focus Africa, you say African Voices, and on those programs, you're showing Africans doing extraordinary things. And you're showing it back to Africans. But what you're actually doing is that you're making it look like those extraordinary things are exceptional. Hmm. Because they're not on your mainstream platform. You've, you've isolated a program to show the great things happening in Africa. It looks like a cool thing, but it's a disaster. Because you're making it look like it's exceptional when it's actually the norm. So on the continent. we're coming back to the yeah. topic we had in the session before, which has to yeah. do with constructive journalism. Um, also, transparency is something I hear here. And maybe uh, let's take a question from the audience uh, to Guido Bulo. The question is, how do you see the covert involvement and steering of public discourse of Meta in these past few years? Do you think we could create a more sustainable media landscape if we requested radical transparency, something Meta has denied us for so long? End of question. Guido. I wonder what we have denied. Um, I think two or three years we started to uh, labeling, for example, um, state-owned media companies on our platform, for example. We started with fact-checking four years ago, 2016, 2017. No, oh, no, it's already five, six years. Um, so we became more public. We tested things like an information button on brands. Um, so if, for example, um, someone like RTL or Thomson Reuters have published something. You were able to click on an icon to get more information, Wikipedia information that gave you more context about the specific publishers where postings have been shared. Um, is there a specific density in, a, in an area? Just to give you an, an, an more information about what's going on with this article, with this post, and um, actually do I see more information from this publisher? So um, we have seen more of that in the past few years, and quite frankly, I mean, we're invested into this, so we are continuing to push for that, provide greater transparency. We have transparency reports as, an, as another thing which um, is for the whole platform. So when it comes to misinformation, um, polarization, violations on our platform, etc. So I think we opened up. Can we do more? Yes, of course. And we're invested to do more, but um, I think it's a journey. Thank you for the question, by the way. Leonie Kama from Germany was that question. And Yasir, I would like to get back to your list. What's on that list? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, well, 30 years from now, here's what I'd like journalism to be. I'd like, to be, I'd like it to listen to their audiences and meet them where they are. I'd like it to be more transparent, uh, not only in terms of the stories, but in terms of the process. You know, how did we arrive at X, Y, and Z? Um, better revenue models, like you suggested. Um, you know, people are already getting used to paying for news, um, and I see that on the rise, and that's a good thing for us because Good journalism costs money. Um, right now, we have the only two actors that are paying living wages to journalists are either state-sponsored or public broadcasting or uh, state actors, and maybe corporate uh, actors. So the rest uh, of us, the rest of the journalism world is full of organizations that are here today and gone tomorrow or are struggling, right? Or, you know, they're are being absorbed by bigger conglomerates. Um, I already said about old people not making content for young people, um, pay living wages to people, uh, diversity. I, I, I really want to talk to about, talk about diversity because it's something that I ran away from my entire career. I would hate to be pigeonholed into a diversity box because I want it to be mainstream. But now that I am editor-in-chief, I see the value of it. 
And that's diversity not just racially and ethnically, but of perspective and socioeconomic class. When was the last time any of us met a working class journalist in a global newsroom? Very rare. Well, right? most, most uh, newsroom actually, you have to have a university degree. Exactly. And we know that some of the best journalists in the world were university dropouts. Uh, we know that. And so I don't know why we ask for university degrees when people who don't have them can easily be. Uh, you know, for instance, many organizations in the UK post job ads in The Guardian or The Economist. A very particular type of person reads those and applies to those jobs. So um, diversifying where we advertise jobs, perhaps. And diversity is currently being seen by a lot of folks as a tactic. It's not. It's a strategy. It needs to happen over years in order to, as Alessandra, my counterpart at Thomson Reuters would say, we cannot be what we cannot see, right? Um, and in order to represent the societies that we serve, it's going to take us a while to overcome our existing structures. Not only in terms of the packaging as in, you know, hmm. brown and black faces on the screen, but brown and black faces, working class and upper middle class and middle class people in management, um, you know, that, that sort of diversity and diversity of perspective, you know, right wing and left wing. There is space in journalism for both perspectives. Um, and in order to be transparent and successful, I think journalism organizations need to take note of that. Sonia wanted to react to that. Um, that diversity issue definitely is uh, very important and it makes it even more important to find ways of refinancing because it's uh, crucial that we um, offer training and journalistic um, like craftsmanship. <laughs> so that's something uh, that we need to offer and that needs investment. But I wanted to add something um, on the transparency issue because I think there can be done more. And um, in 2018, the European Commission um, asked for a report by an expert group um, asking for what is the scope of this disinformation thing at all, how can we define it, and what could maybe society, also the platforms, do um, to prevent harm to society. And then um, the first result was a code of practice where the big platforms all came together and agreed on, okay, this is what we can do, and it was based on self-regulation. So it was reviewed after a couple of years, and the result of that review was, no, nah, that's really not enough, harm hasn't been prevented yet. So just a couple of days ago, a renewed code of practice was published, and that included a co-regulation and a self-regulation. But still, what is criticized, even in that renewed code of practice, is transparency into the algorithms by researchers, by academics, Academics, we still don't know if it's possible. You mentioned the monetization of disinformation. Nobody knows whether that has been stopped at all because actually I think it has not. It's still going on, but there's not enough data that is provided by the big platforms to researchers to even find out how big is the harm because they always refer that it is the heart and the core of their business model. So in that is important in um, uh, reference to transparency and what Meta can do. And I'd like to add that diversity, <laughs> diversity, not the disorder that is being arrested by tokenism, wanting to be seen as diverse. So we need to see behind the diversity. When you see these people on the screen, what, who are the people controlling? Who are the people with the real power? Who are the people in charge of the numbers? When I say numbers, in, cha in charge of the money. If you say you have an Africa program, or you have a Southeast Asia program, or you have a Southern America program, do you have those programs because, wow, that's what is cool now? Or they, are they actually a real part of your programs? If you check your budget, is there a correlation between the numbers, the, the, the numbers of the eyes in those countries and those continents versus the numbers in the places where you're spending the bulk of the money. So diversity, not because it's cool now, inclusion, not because it's cool now, but because that's justice, because that's what's supposed to happen. Because ultimately, whether we like it or not, in 30 years' time, we would have a more equalized space, whether we like it or not. Just the same way that over the so last... That's, that's for you, that's a given. That yeah, it's vote. going to happen. So in the best thing is... Um, in spite of companies trying to make money with it, yeah. in spite of algorithms, yeah. in spite of bubbles, everybody being in a bubble, yeah. you still think we'll have a more equalized space. Because, again, to look at the future, just look at the past. Capitalism drove 
colonialism. It drove the slave trade. Journalists didn't write of the slave trade as a crime. They wrote it as a trade. But here, we're in a much better place, right? Everybody's cool with the way the world is. Racism has not disappeared, but we're not reporting it like we're reporting it 50 years ago. So whether we like it or not, the world will go in the direction of justice. So it's just better that we're doing something about it ourselves. Because the ones that are not doing something about it, we'll find that they, they've disappeared. But ultimately, in, the, in this specific conversation, whether we like it or not, there'll be more representation, there'll be more democratization, there'll be more voices from around the world being heard. But that's, that's not the trend we're seeing through all those social media platforms at the moment. On well, the contrary, it's, well, looking, it's brought in dem democracy in danger in the US, We're well, looking from France. different perspectives. Okay. I'm looking from the perspective of someone who started from zero, who had no voice in the game. So I'm thinking, okay, it's a different world now because if CNN, if DW, if Reuters, whoever post something about Africa that I don't agree with, I don't have to send a letter to their editor to say, correct this. I have it. I can just tweet it. And by the way, you don't have to have one million followers to influence that. You just need to have a presence in that place. Everybody potentially is an influencer because somebody just needs to pick it and it becomes viral. A lot of what goes viral now for people that are on this platform, you see that they don't necessarily come from people with the biggest voices. So we're looking at it from different perspectives. I believe that there are many gaps that need to be filled, but on the whole, based on where we're coming from, I think that we're in a much better place. That's my opinion, and it comes from the fact that I come from a place where representation globally was almost new, and now it's there, and it can only get better because the voices are coming, um, the people are coming, and everybody starts to see the gaps that they didn't used to see before because they're open to a new pers perspective and a new paradigm. I com I'm completely understand your perspective, um, and I think you're absolutely right that we have different perspectives here just because of the countries we live in. But I want to come back to, to the part where you say things are getting better, and I say things are getting worse because it's... Uh, I have to Western liberal democracies, it's obvious, yeah. or please correct me if you see it differently, that be certain behavior on social media platforms is a danger to democracy. We've seen it in the elections. So okay. how do you bring these things together? I'd look at the I'll use this movement. cup, excuse me, please. I'll use this cup as an example. If my cup was empty and your cup was full, when my cup gets here and yours gets here, you say your cup is half empty, I say my cup is half full. So it's the same position. It's a classic. Uh, e exactly. So <laughs> if my cup was empty and it gets here, I say it's half full. If your cup was full and it gets here, it's half empty. So whether fortunately or unfortunately, we're looking at these things from very, very different perspectives. I'm sorry for Western democracies, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I just want to, I'm totally on board with that. Short-term pessimism and long-term optimism, right? And that's because, yes, there's populism, there's you know, right-wing white supremacy and all of that and outrage on the platforms. But look at the people who are rising against it, right? Look at the people who are, who probably would have never uh, been seen by us as actors in those spheres. Look at AOC in, in, in America, right? Look at, look at uh, you know, look at Greta Thunberg, you know, a kid who is so engaged in, in, you know, climate change. I mean, would that have been possible if it wasn't for you know, um, the, the voices that are making us scared? Um, no, I don't think so. And that's what encourages me, is that, you know, yes, there is outrage, yes, there is negativity, yes, there is populism, but there's large, large mobilizations of people and good journalism happening out there that is countering that. And, yeah, that's something to feel encouraged about. Short-term pessimism, long-term optimism. I think we have being optimistic. <laughs> Time for two short questions. So short question, only questions please, and please let me know whom would you, you would like to ask. I saw your hand first. Gentleman in the olive green. Yeah, you, right there. Go ahead. Thank you so much. So I'll keep it short. Uh, it's for, for the journalists, both of you. Uh, do you think we should keep looking at social media as platform or as infrastructure? because we depend so much on them, and we saw like in the previous month when Meta was shut down, every, like the internet shut down. So is it, should we change our view to them as infrastructure and treat them as that way? So the, you said both journalists, we have more journalists than two, but then I'll just put it to Sonia, okay? You wanna answer that one? Um, actually, I think it depends on the brand, because you cannot ignore a big platform. Um, 
and you have to make the best to yeah, be recompensated for the value that you bring with your content. And there are different ways. I mean, we also talk uh, with Meta, but um, there are ways you could use it uh, to get your brand known, but also um, if neighboring rights, for example, are um, respected and you get a fair share of everything that comes out of your own originated content, that's okay. But you have to be very careful because there will probably, or the, the danger is great that there will be a kind of dependency. And then you're on the platform, it makes you big, but without the platform you're nothing, and that's a risk. I agree. I mean, platforms should be part of your strategy, and conversations with those platforms should also be part of your strategy. Um, and, but I don't think it's wise to, to be dependent on them because then, then you're toast. And the can platforms I, will I, change, right? So first, JJ, thank you. Yeah. The platforms will change. The platforms will change. It's like music. We listen to music differently even over our short lives, right? Um, the way we listened in the 90s is not the way we listened in the 2000s. It's not the way we listened as recent as 2010. It's not how we listen now. The platforms will change even for journalism. But the ethics will not change. The values will not change. The essence must not change. And the essence in this case, the general society, our collective humanity, not the views or interests of specific groups on account of their power, or on account of their money. And so you're saying the essence of journalism is not going to change? Yeah, yeah the essence will never change. And for me, the, when I say the essence is we're trying to create a better society where as many people, if not everybody, is represented. They have their voices represented. They have their stories represented. They feel like they are represented, and they have the opportunity to tell their story, and everybody's listening to those stories. So ultimately, not an El Dorado, but a world where everybody can generally agree that their story is not missing, and nobody's claiming the power over their story, and nobody's claiming the authority over their places and, and, and the things that belong to them. Guido, would you like to react or we can take a next question? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I agree with both of you, change is necessary and you shouldn't be dependent on platforms. I mean, it should fit into your strategy. If it doesn't fit into your strategy, it doesn't make sense. So if you feel like you get something out of it, do it. Otherwise, don't do it. Second hand I saw was up there, the gentleman in the black shirt. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. This is Mustafa. I'm the Media and Communication Coordinator at Hand in Hand for Aiden Development. Uh, I'm Syrian, came from Turkey. So I'm just trying to learn from the past as, as we are thinking of uh, the future. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, I've lost my brother in Syria who kidnapped and then killed by ISIS and at the same time, I've lost my father, um, who arrested and also killed by Syrian regime. So my, my brother was a journalist, field reporter, and I was helping him in 2012 and 13. So to learn from the past how we can um, connect be between the lessons learned and the providing uh, protection for journalists and planning for the future. That's my question for, um, also uh, using the platforms, how we can depend or rely on the digital platforms to advocate on the uh, journalists' rights in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mustafa, and I think I speak on the behalf of all of us, our deepest condolences uh, for what happened to your family. So does anyone want to take up what Mustafa raised here? Um, oh man, um, I don't think any of us is qualified to, to comment on that, on what happened to the journalists over there. I mean, this is um, horrifically uh, a daily reality in our world. Just uh, the, yesterday, I think, uh, Jody Ginsburg gave a speech about how already, um, you know, the year is, is about half over and we've lost tens of journalists in uh, areas of conflict, and particularly local journalists. Um, I honestly don't know what the solution is, I, what, what I, and, and I honestly don't know what we can use that uh, in the future for, other than strengthen um, you know, the protections that we have today. I mean, Reuters has 
a robust sort of security detail and risk assessment every time we send journalists out there. But local journalists, I, I don't know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not qualified to answer that question. It's, yeah, it's awful. Do we have one more question? We have time for one more question. Hand up there in the last row. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering, I was looking at some data about how in quarter one of this year, less than 1% of the post views on the feed actually have links to news sites. And at the same time, from the digital news report, uh, users saying that Facebook is, or, or is the platform that most users say it's too news heavy. So is there an argument for journalism and Facebook to go our separate ways? <laughs> this is for you. Yeah, yeah definitely. I think so. <laughs> Thanks, Yasir. I was going to say. Um, of course, there's an argument to make for it. Um, I mean, the news report is just out one week. So obviously, we're also digesting and discussing with uh, Rasmus um, on, yeah, on the findings. And um, I mean, news is, is important to society. I mean, we are part of the society. Of course, news will always be a part of Facebook. But um, will it play that? huge role that most people assume it is. Um, I mean, you said 1%, uh, we say 4% of, of content on our platform is news. It's, it's a small part of the platform. So um, I don't have a definitive answer right now uh, where we're going with news. I mean, I can only say we have a news partnerships team around the world working with news organizations, supporting journalists. And by the way, to the question earlier, um, having partnerships with Rory Pack Trust and other um, foundations that are supporting reporters out in the field, um, that they can actually do their work and that they get support in case they need some support. Um, so we're committed to that, but what the future will look like, we don't know yet. But um, the Reuters report, for example, said we have a little news fatigue going on, even if you have the Ukraine effect. Uh, so are we still going to have news? Last question, news as we know it? and that would be part of the essence of journalism, to my understanding at least, in 30 years? There's always the room for news. Um, you know, sometimes more people will come for it, sometimes fewer people will come for it. And, and you saw that at the beginning of COVID, uh, our audiences quadrupled, and eventually people got tired and they left. But next time something like this happens, will people just not show up? No, they will come back again. So people come to news when they need it. It's like going to your fridge. When you're hungry, you go to the fridge. <laughs> you're not hungry, you don't. Especially when you're in home office. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us this evening, and hope to see you on the boat, part of you at least. Thank you to our panel, of course. <laughs>